Uh, great, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here to present. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about um, some of the work I've been doing recently with my colleagues, um, Lawrence, Paul, Rob, Nikos and Keith in the in the dynamics group at Sheffield. Um, and this work has been on risk based active learning for structural health monitoring. Um, so I'll start off by giving um, a quick introduction to um, SHM. Even though I know, I know I know most of you will probably be familiar with it, but it's just nice to sort of motivate motivate why we why we want to do some of some of the things that we talk about in this work today. So um, structural health monitoring is a field of engineering that's concerned with um, developing and implementing online damage detection systems for um, aerospace, civil, or mechanical infrastructure. Uh, and the general idea is that you acquire some data from a structure. So in the research group at Sheffield, we like to collect dynamic response data, such as accelerations or acoustic emissions. And then after some processing of this uh, data that we acquire, um, we hope to be able to infer the health of a structure. And this inference uh, of the health states is usually achieved via um, statistical pattern recognition. Um, so the development of these statistical models for inferring structural health states um, is gonna be the topic of, um, of today's talk. Um, but a key motivation for developing and implementing um, SHM systems is to aid in decision making about the operation and maintenance of structures. Uh, and so by informing um, the decision making um, uh, for a structure with data from a health monitoring system, uh, we hoped that, you know, we sort of hope to be able to achieve um, maybe improved safety, um, cost optimal inspection and maintenance strategies, uh, or even the extension of um, the operating life of the structure past the original design specification. Uh, and so given that we want SHM to help us with um, decision making, uh, we perhaps would like to answer the question, can we develop statistical classifiers for SHM with consideration for the operation and maintenance decision processes that they're being used to inform? Um, so the rest of the talk will be split into um, sort of four sections. Um, we'll go over a method for representing SHM decisions as influence diagrams. Then we'll talk about how these decision processes can be incorporated into machine learning algorithms. And then finally, um, we'll look at the, uh, we'll demonstrate the risk-based active learning algorithm uh, on a couple of uh, case studies. Uh, right, so as I mentioned, first of all, we need a way to represent the decisions that we're interested in making um, during an SHM campaign. Um, and there are several options, several options for doing this. However, um, the one I've chosen is a representation based upon um, probabilistic graphical models. Uh, and again, some of you might be familiar with these, but um, I'll give a quick explanation just in case anyone isn't. Um, so, uh, Graphical models or probabilistic graphical models essentially represent um, factorizations of joint probability distributions. And perhaps the most simple form of PGM is um, a Bayesian network, uh, which we have here. So Bayesian networks are directed acyclic graphs in which the nodes represent random variables and the edges connecting the nodes um, represent the conditional dependencies between those variables. Um, so in the in a simple Bayesian network we have shown here, uh, the joint um, probability distribution over the variables x, y, and z is factorized into the probability of x times the probability of y given x times the probability of z given y. Um, uh, so an important thing to note about um, these graphical models is that uh, you can make observations on a subset of the variables in the graph and then uh, using general inference algorithms, you can compute um, updated posterior, marginal, um, or joint distributions over the remaining unobserved variables. So um, the inference in Bayesian networks provides some of the modeling power that we'd require for decision uh, for the for representing our decision processes. Um, specifically, they're they're really useful for reasoning under uncertainty. Um, but we're still missing two key elements, um, and those are the decisions themselves and the costs associated with um, perhaps states or events we're interested in uh, um, working out the probabilities of and the actions um, that we may decide upon. Um, so the influence diagrams are an extension of Bayesian networks that incorporate um, square decision nodes and diamond-shaped utility nodes 
uh, and fundamentally, um, these represent expected utility functions. So uh, optimal decisions can be found by maximizing the expected utility that these diagrams represent. Um, and so we can start to see how um, these sorts of influence diagrams could be useful for modeling SHM decisions if we consider this basic example. Um, so where we have a, um, some failure event F, which has some probability of occurrence that is influenced by some um, decidable action. Uh, so this could be like a repair of a structure or a maintenance, uh, some other maintenance action. And then um, the decided action has some costs associated with it, as does um, the failure of our structure. Um, so here we have a slightly more complex um, uh, influence diagram that represents a Markovian decision process in discrete time. <clears throat> Uh, and this could correspond to, for example, maybe uh, maintaining a structure, let's say. Uh, so in the middle here, uh, we have a variable that represents the global health state of our structure. And this health state is evolving in time. Um, so we also, from, uh, we also have some data um, that is generated uh, according to the health state, um, which uh, is denoted by new down here. Uh, and this can be observed. Um, and then up here we have um, some failure, uh, some failure mode F of a structure that we're going to call F. And it's, it's sort of convenient to consider specific failure modes of structures because that allows us to more easily assign um, the costs of failure up here. But it also allows us to um, help. It can also aid in sort of the um, design of our SHM systems um, such that we could like maybe we're able to um, focus on specific subsets of health states that we're interested in targeting with our monitoring system. Um, so uh, you can see down here that we have some decidable actions and these influence the future health states of uh, the future health states of our structure. Um, and these would be your maintenance actions um, such as repair or replacement of components. Uh, and these actions also have costs associated, which is represented uh, by this node down here. Um, so an optimal maintenance strategy for a structure can be found by using this influ influence diagram and maximizing the expected utility with respect to the decisions. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of the submodels within this decision process just to, um, just to clarify this a bit. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we have some observation model that we're interested in. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a statistical pattern recognition classifier trained via some machine learning method, and it takes damage sensitive features extracted from um, the data acquired from the structure, and then it maps those to a probability distribution over the health states. Um, and the use of a probabilistic classifier here is uh, vital as um, retaining um, a probability distribution over the health states is really key to making the decisions that we want to make uh, robust to uncertainty. Uh, so it's, it's this observation model here that we are wanting to develop today with respect to the decision process that it fits within. Um, uh, so it's also worth noting that in the graph here, um, we're sort of assuming that there's a generative model. Uh, so the observations are generated according to a health state, but um, you don't necessarily have to have a generative model and the probabilistic discriminative classifier is um, an equally valid choice for this submodel. Next, we have the transition model, um, and this specifies the probability of a future health state occurring given the current state. Uh, and it's essentially a model that forecasts how the structure is degrading over time. Um, since we're just interested in developing the classifiers today, for the purpose of the work um, that, that's being presented, we're just going to assume that this um, transition model is fixed and known. Um, this is, it's actually, you know, these models, these transition models relate to sort of the prognosis of structures and is really like a whole um, research field um, in, in and of itself. So um, it's, it's, this is like, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm sort of being slightly hand wavy here, but we're just going to assume that this transition model is um, fixed and known. Um, so in addition to the current health state, the future health state is also conditionally dependent on the actions that we decide at the current time. Um, you can see here that we have the probability of the, uh, the health state at the next time step um, jointly conditioned on the current health state and the action. Um, so the transition model must also reflect this and it will be here, for example, where we are able to express how an action such as maintenance might affect our structure. 
Okay, so by formulating um, the SHM decision process in a way which considers both the cost associated with failure events and the probability that those failure events occur, what we're essentially doing is um, assessing the risk of failure at each time step or doing some sort of risk assessment. Um, and we can also turn to the field of uh, probabilistic risk assessment to define the final model that we need for this SHM decision problem, and that is the failure model. Uh, and the purpose of the failure model is to map um, from a prob probability distribution of the global health states to a probability of failure. Um, so here we take the viewpoint that we can define some failure mode of our structure as a combination of failures at a component, joint and substructure level. Uh, and as such, um, the global failures can be expressed using a fault tree, which is a combination of um, local failures that are related through Boolean logic gates. Um, cool. So in order to fit into the probabilistic graphical model framework, uh, we want to convert the fault trees into a Bayesian network. And fortunately, there's a, a, a fairly well-established mapping for doing this, where um, for each um, component, joint, and substructure in the fault tree, um, we have um, a random variable in our Bayesian network that represents the local health state of that um, component, joint, or substructure. Uh, and then the conditional probability distributions between these um, variables representing components and substructures uh, are defined as the, the, the truth tables that correspond to the appropriate logic gates. Um, so here we have an example of how an OR gate would be mapped into a Bayesian network. Um, so for example, we have some um, substructure C that is um, whose um, failure is um, governed by two components A and B. Uh, according to um, an OR logic gate. Uh, and then you can see in the Bayesian network representation, we have um, a node for the substructure C, a node for um, the components A and B, and then we can specify the, the conditional probability distribution um, P of C given A and B as um, being this, um, this OR truth table. Okay, so fitting this fault tree into the overall framework will look something that looks a bit like this. Um, and to reiterate, um, the purpose of this failure mode is to convert the probability distribution we obtain over our health states from the classifier and map this distribution up to um, a, a probability of a failure event occurring. All right, so now we have a way of formally representing um, the SHM decision processes that we're interested in. We can start to think about how we can develop the classifiers used, with it, uh, used within the decision process with consideration for the decision making. Uh, and as I touched upon earlier, we want to do this using um, machine learning methods. Um, okay, so sadly, the traditional supervised and unsupervised machine learning paradigms are unsuitable for um, SHM decision support applications. Supervised learning can be used um, to learn classifiers when you have some input data and the corresponding class labels as outputs. Um, and in, in SHM, this would correspond to, you know, having examples of your damage sensitive features, labels with health states from which those data originated. Um, unfortunately, when, as probably as many of you may be familiar with, when SHM systems are initially deployed, we don't have label data corresponding to the damage states because it's sort of costly to obtain and acquiring it would amount to deliberately damaging your asset, uh, which could be very valuable or it could be uh, even just a one-off structure. Um, so because of this lack of labeled data, supervised learning can't be applied here. Um, unsupervised learning on the other hand can be applied to data, uh, to data when there are no labels present. Uh, and these learning techniques identify underlying patterns within data. Unfortunately, um, even though we can find the patterns without the labels corresponding to the health states, these patterns are of limited use for decision making as there is no context available. For example, you might be able to discern that two consecutive data points belong to differing classes, but without knowing which health states they are associated with, you can't really decide what's the best action or what action should be taken. So active learning is a form of partially supervised machine learning, and it's sort of a neat way to overcome the limitations uh, that's presented by supervised and unsupervised methods. 
um, and partially supervised learning methods are characterized by the use of both uh, labels and unlabeled data. So the, the core principle of active learning algorithms uh, is summarized in this um, sort of diagram here. And essentially, um, the algorithms um, query, they automatically query the labels for unlabeled data so as to extend the labeled data set. Um, then the classifier can be uh, learned in a supervised manner on this informed subset of labeled data. Um, in the context of SHM, the querying of this label information for a data point corresponds to uh, the inspection of a structure in order to determine, in order to determine its current health state. Um, so data points, when active learning has been applied in the context of structural health monitoring previously, data points are typically queried according to a measure of their information, such as entropy or likelihood given the current model. However, since, um, since we want to formulate the active learning process with respect to the SHM decision process, uh, we're going to use a different uh, query measure to guide the acquisition of data labels. Um, instead of using an information theoretic query measure, we're going to use a decision theoretic query measure, specifically um, the expected value of information. Um, so simplicity, here we're just going to consider the expected value of perfect information for a data point um, in the context of the decision process. And by perfect information, what I mean here is uh, the, the, the information or the data label that we obtain is without uncertainty. We essentially obtain the ground truth. Um, uh, you know, this, this, this is a fairly large assumption perhaps in the um, context of structural health monitoring, but um, um, you know, it, it, it's a fine assumption to sort of demonstrate um, this risk-based risk -based active learning process. Um, and it can be sort of overcome by having a model that sort of um, describes perhaps how the uncertainties in your um, inspection, um, structural inspections uh, manifest. So um, the expected value of perfect information, um, or EVPI for short, can be interpreted as the price of a, uh, that a decision maker should be willing to pay in order to gain access perfect information regarding an otherwise unknown or uncertain state prior to making a decision. Uh, so in the context of the SHM problem, the information we want to consider obtaining is the true health state of our structure and the decision that we're making is um, some maintenance decision. So we can calculate the EVPI as the difference um, in the maximum expected utility of the decision process, given that we do inspect the structure before selecting a maintenance action and the maximum expected utility given that we don't inspect. Uh, and this is, um, this is sort of um, summarized in this definition here, uh, where um, this I represents the influence diagram that we have for the decision process when we don't inspect. Uh, and um, this I with the subscript down here denotes the modified decision process um, that we have when we have this additional edge from the health state to the decision, indicating that we observe this health state before making the decision. Um, so another way of thinking about it is that the expected value of perfect information arises from the possible increase in the maximum expected utility we might be able to get um, should a policy, uh, should, should the, uh, a change in policy occur when the true health state is observed. Um, so like there's, there's quite a nice results that we can get from using um, this expected value of information as a query measure. Uh, and it's um, so, and that we can we now have a convenient criterion for um, triggering the inspections of our structure provided um, that we're able to attribute a cost to the inspection. Simply, um, we send out an engineer to inspect our structure when the expected value of information for a data point um, exceeds the cost of our inspections. Um, okay, so the risk-based approach to active learning is summarized in this flowchart here. And I'll, so, um, I'll give you a quick tour of it. Um, so we can start off by initializing um, the classifier at the beginning of a monitoring campaign using whatever limited information we have available. Um, so this, for example, this could be a very small, um, a very small set of labeled data um, it could, uh, you know, it could be from just a prior or it could be um, from some predictions from a physics-based model. 
Um, so this is this this occurs up here, and we tr we train this model. We train a model using this limited uh, li limited uh, information on knowledge. Um, then when we when we acquire new data from the monitoring system, it comes in unlabeled. So we use this unlabeled data to predict what our um, what our health state is um, using using our current model. And then from these predictions, we can um, we can determine the expected value of obtaining a label for that data point uh, with respect to our decision process. Um, then if the expected value of perfect information is greater than the cost of inspection, we can send out an engineer um, to determine its health state, the structure's health state. And we can use this health state as a label for the data points, um, incorporate, into, in, incorporate it into our labeled data set, and then retrain the model in a supervised manner on this newly extended um, labeled data set. Um, finally, it's worth mentioning here that um, since the classifiers that we are developing are being used to inform decision making, we're not strictly interested in the classifier accuracy, which would be, you know, how many labels the classifier correctly predicts in a test data set. Rather, what we're interested in is how much better our decision making is because of the insight provided by the classifier. Um, so because of this, we're going to assess the performance of these classifiers that we're developing with respect to um, decision making by using something that we term the decision accuracy, which is defined as um, the number of correct decisions made divided by the um, total number of decisions made for a test data set. And here, um, a decision can be considered correct if an agent using the statistical classifier selects the same decision as an agent in possession of the true health state uh, for a given data point. So this is uh, this is like really um, sort of um, an, a decision equivalent to a, the most basic sort of um, classification accuracy. Um, you know, there are there would be other alternatives um, for assessing the performance, such as you could use a um, like a, a, re a receiver operating characteristic or um, a, an, a utility based um, performance metric. But um, for the sort of the simple decision problems that we're considering today, um, this 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 um, this this sort of decision accuracy um, is, uh, is is sufficient and sort of gives a nice um, overview. Okay, so um, that summarizes the risk-based active learning process. Um, so now we can sort of see how this active learning algorithm performs on a numerical case study. Right, um, so here we have um, a data set that's been generated by um, sampling from four bivariate Gaussian distributions. Um, so, which basically means we have two discriminative features that we're using to infer our health states. And these are denoted by new one and new two. Um, and let's suppose that each of the four classes that we have um, corresponds to some condition of our structure, some fictitious structure, let's say, with, um, uh, and these these uh, these these um, conditions of our structure also relate to the operating capacity that we're interested in maintaining. So let's say state one corresponds to the undamaged condition where the structure is fully functional. State two um, corresponds to some minor damage where um, the structure remains fully functional still. Um, state three corresponds to some significant damage where the structure must operate um, at a reduced capacity. And let's say state four corresponds to some critical damage where the structure is um, non-operational or can consider to have failed. Um, and as you can see, uh, we have some order to our data set such that the structure progresses through um, these health states periodically. Um, and it's sort of implicit in this data set that when we have a transition from a um, advanced damage state to a undamaged state that there's been some sort of intervention, perhaps a maintenance action. Um, okay, so given that we have a data set, we need to define a decision process around around this data set and that describes this problem. Uh, so this is what the influence diagram that we're considering is going to look like. Um, and we have, um, we're going to consider a binary decision between doing nothing and performing maintenance. Uh, so as you can see here, the decisions that we can choose will influence our future health states, and this this uh, this influence is described. Pardon me. This influence is described by um, these transition models here. Um, so for the for the transition model, uh, given that we 
don't do anything to our structure. Um, you can see that there's a propensity for the state to stay in its current health states with some probability that the damage advances, the damage state advances. Also, it's um, worth noting that this uh, matrix is upper triangular. Um, and this basically corresponds to us assuming that um, the structure is only allowed to degrade unless maintenance is performed. Um, and down here, so down here we have the um, transition matrix given that we do perform maintenance. Um, and essentially what we're saying here is that performing maintenance will reset the structure to its undamaged state with high probability. Uh, and then there's some sort of small probability here that um, our structure remains in its current health state. Um, for the simplicity, for, uh, to sort of keep everything nice and compact, uh, we're, we're going to omit the fault tree portion of the influence diagrams here and just map directly from the health state to a utility. Um, so here, um, the utilities are specified to reflect the operational capacity of the structure. Uh, so states one and two have um, some positive utility, because um, uh, this is the undamaged state, and the, or sorry, these states correspond to at being at full operational capacity. State three is the reduced operational capacity state. So this is some smaller um, smaller positive utility. And state four is um, we're going to consider we're considering the structure to a fail. So we've got some um, larger negative utility here. In terms of the actions that we can decide, um, we're saying do nothing has uh, a zero utility or no cost. And um, performing maintenance has a cost of 30 units. Uh, finally, we can say we're going to say that the cost of inspection for this problem is seven units, um, or which is the same as saying that it has a negative utility, uh, a, a utility of negative seven. Okay, so the classifier that we're going to try and develop here is a Gaussian mixture model, where the means and covariances for each class are learned from the limited subset, of the limited labeled data that we have via Bayesian inference. Uh, and to reflect the scarcity of the labeled data, we often have in SHM problems. We're looking at a model here uh, trained on an initial data set that's comprised of just um, a few data points for the undamaged class and then a single data point for each of the um, uh, damaged classes. And so th this is sort of to try and reflect that we often don't have um, very good information, incomplete information uh, about our damaged states. Um, the figure on the right hand side here shows the value of information or the expected value of perfect information over the feature space. Uh, so the pink regions show um, uh, areas of the feature space with um, high value. Uh, so these are the regions where data are likely to be queried. Uh, and they, the, these, these uh, high value regions correspond to areas of the feature space where there is a large uncertainty between the health states that, we, that warrant differing courses of action. Okay, so um, this little GIF here is showing the active learning of um, of the classifier, and you can see we start with the initial model and um, sort of query. You can see here the data that are being queried until we reach some um, until we reach some final model. You can also see that the um, the value of information uh, over the feature space is changing throughout the learning process. Okay, so this is the um, the final updated model after the risk-based active learning process, and you can see from um, the plot on the left that the algorithm is heavily querying data points that lie on the boundary between um, class three and class four, which correspond to our um, fail state and our reduced operational capacity state. Um, what's interesting is that because of the biased sampling, um, the model still doesn't fit particularly well. So this could indicate that perhaps the algorithm is prioritizing the decision-making um, performance of the model over the classification performance of the model, which is sort of what we had hoped given that we're using a decision theoretic query measure opposed to an information theoretic query measure. Um, on the right-hand side graph here, you can also see that there are regions, the regions of high value of information are now more concentrated around class three. Uh, and this is giving us an indication that the decision boundary for the problem that we set up before uh, lies somewhere in this region. Um, so to sort of evaluate the performance of the algorithm, uh, we applied it to um, a thousand randomly initialized Gaussian mixture models. And for comparison, 
an additional model was learned using the same number of data points, but, uh, but these data points were sampled at random. So in the figure on the left here, you can see which data points from the unlabeled data set were queried. And as you'd expect, when you use the um, random or unguided query, uh, querying, all the data points are uh, sampled equally. However, when you use the um, EVPI-based querying, you can see that there's definitely a preference for um, specific um, observations in the data set. Uh, and this result is sort of a, in agreement um, with what we saw in the last slide, where data were queried um, primarily uh, from classes three and four, um, mostly from class three, as you can see here, and uh, to a lesser, lesser extent from class four. Um, so how does this active learning process um, that considers risk affect the performance of decision-making agents? Well, you can see from this figure on the right here that the decision accuracy improves much more rapidly as a function of the number of queries when you use um, uh, risk-based active learning compared to random sampling. Uh, and this is a great result because um, if you recall, when we specify the cost of inspection, the number of queries um, made is directly proportional to the amount of money that's spent inspecting a structure during the during the time frame for which the data was acquired. Um, so this this sort of gives us an indication that perhaps we can develop these statistical classifiers and achieve good decision accuracy or decision making performance in a cost effective manner by using value of information um, to guide query. Um, okay, so we got some nice results um, on a data set which in some respects is very idealized you know all those clusters were very nice and gaussian so let's see our performance on uh, uh, an experimental data set um, the experimental data set we're going to be using today um, was acquired from the z24 bridge um, which i'm sure some of you are familiar with um, and this this uh, z24 bridge was a highway bridge in switzerland that was monitored um, prior to its demolition and it's a, it's a widely used data set in, in, in SHM, um, in SHM research especially. Um, so during the monitoring campaign, damage was introduced to the bridge um, progressively. Um, and also throughout, throughout the monitoring, uh, the bridge experienced in very low temperatures um, uh, during the campaign. Um, so the fig if we look at the figure on the right here first, um, it shows the first four natural frequencies of the bridge. The normal, um, the normal undamaged condition data is shown in green here. Uh, and then as we sort of progress through the monitoring um, campaign, you can see that we experience, uh, we, can, we can observe uh, an increase in the natural frequencies. And this data uh, that's shown in orange um, corresponds to the um, cold temperature effect data. Um, and so that the, the, this increase in the natural frequencies um, is likely due to you know, stiffening of the bridge deck um, that's caused by caused by the drop in temperature. Um, towards the end here, we have the data for which damage has been introduced to the um, to the bridge, um, and we've split this data into two classes. We have an incipient damage um, condition that's shown in purple, and we have an advanced damage condition that's shown in pink. Um, so, for the statistical for this. For the statistical classifier in the decision process that we're going to formulate here, we're going to use all four natural frequencies as the discriminative features. Um, so the model learned is going to be a mixture of four four-dimensional Gaussian distributions. Um, obviously, four-dimensional distributions are not very easy to visualize, so we're going to look at the data and models um, projected into two dimensions um, using principal component analysis. And so here you can see the first two principal components of, of these natural frequencies. Once again, we need to um, define a decision process for this problem. Um, the influence diagram and our choices of action are going to be the same as they were in the previous case study. Um, so we can either do nothing or perform maintenance. Again, we have some transition models here. And um, these are also similar to the ones we used in the last case study. However, this time we want to, uh, we want to be able to allow transitions from states to and from states one and two, because these states essentially represent weather conditions. And you know that these were the normal condition and the temperature effect condition. Um, but other than that, we are keeping the assumption that the structure's health cannot improve without intervention and that there's a propensity to remain in the current damage condition. Um, 
the maintenance action returns the bridge to its undamaged state again with high probability but because we don't want to impose the con like because we've got to be careful sort of specifying these probabilities because we don't want to end up imposing the, con um, the condition that maintaining the bridge affects the weather which is why we sort of end up with these slightly odd looking probabilities in, the, in these first two columns here as for the utilities um, we can associate um, some to the states of the bridge. Um, so, and these are, you know, we want these to reflect what we might assign for the operation of a bridge. So we have some positive utilities again for the classes that correspond to the bridge being undamaged. We then have some negative utility associated with the incipient damage. And then we have a very large negative utility for the advanced damage state. And this is supposed to reflect the potential risk to human life that might be associated with a bridge collapsing. Um, finally, we have um, um, a the, our do nothing action is again uh, costs us nothing. Our maintenance action costs us 100 units, and our inspection costs us 30 units. Um, so here's the initial model before the active learning. And again, we've just trained it on some very limited set of data. Uh, again, three points for the undamaged class and one point for the, um, for the uh, other classes. Uh, and again, as you can see, it's not a great fit for the data. Um, you know, this, this, this class really doesn't capture the variance particularly well for the undamaged data. Uh, and then in the EBPI figure, it's worth noting that we have um, region, a region of high value of information between our two undamaged classes here. Uh, so this, this region here is perhaps something that we might hope to get rid of by doing our learning process. So once again, here's a GIF showing the, showing the active learning. You can see the querying of the points and the updating of the, of the, of the distribution. Uh, and then you can see again on the right here, the, the value of information changing over our feature space. Okay, so here's the um, final updated model again, uh, following the risk-based active learning. And once again, we can see that the data is preferentially queried in specific regions of the feature uh, uh, specific regions of the feature space. Um, this time on the boundary between class one and class three. Um, this updated model, uh, this updated model, definitely fits the data um, better. Uh, but it's still not an excellent fit um, since this cluster that corresponds to the cold temperature data has been dragged all, all the way over here by the bias sampling. Uh, what is nice to see is that from the EVPI plot on the right here is that we have a region of high, expect, uh, high expected value of information um, between our undamaged class and our incipient damage class. Uh, and furthermore, we don't have um, that high, uh, region of high value of information between our two undamaged classes. So um, we can interpret this region of low value of low expected value of information as being the region of the feature space where the decision making agent can be confident that the optimal policy is to do nothing. Uh, what's more is that we can interpret this region of, um, of low value of information as the parts of the feature space where the agent is confident that the optimal strategy is to perform maintenance. And therefore it follows that the band of high EVPI that separates class one and class three um, is the region of the feature space where the agent is unsure what the optimal maintenance policy is. And so the agent therefore recommends an inspection. Uh, once again, uh, we applied the risk-based active learning process to a thousand randomly initialized mixture models and compared them to the models learned via random sampling. And you can see, um, as, as was the case before, that um, the random sampling results in uniform querying and the EVPI-based querying results in uh, preferential querying. And again, uh, we get a nice improvement in the decision-making performance when we, uh, when we use the risk-based active learning um, process. Um, so to summarize, an important motivation for the development of SHM systems is to improve the decision-making performance regarding the operation of structures. Uh, and stati statistical classifiers are a key technology required for SHM because they are used to infer the health states of the structure from data acquired by the monitoring system. 
So what we've presented today, um, or rather the work we've done recently, is that we've formulated a risk-based approach to actively learn these classification models by using labels obtained via structural inspections. And this querying process or this inspection process is being guided by the expected value of perfect information with respect to the maintenance decision process. Um, the case studies uh, that we have demonstrated on indicate that we can get a cost-effective improvement to decision-making performance by using these risk-based active learning algorithms and expected value of information can be used as a, uh, as a convenient criterion to mandate our structural inspections. It's also apparent uh, from the case studies um, that sampling bias is very prevalent, uh, which although it aids in the learning of the, the decision boundaries, um, it biases the generative models that we are using. So because of this, we're currently looking at methods to counteract this bias, um, specifically by applying semi-supervised learning to generative models and by actually substituting the generative models for discriminative, discriminative ones. Um, so, and we're seeing some we're seeing some nice results with these two. Um, so here you can see that by using semi-supervised learning, we're able to learn a well-defined decision boundary um, whilst retaining a good generative um, distribution. Um, the discriminative classifier shown down here is also capable uh, of learning a well-defined decision boundary, but has a nice property um, that the generative model doesn't have, um, which is that it considers outlying data to have high value of information. Uh, and this is perhaps a very desirable characteristic for our decision-making agents to have. Um, so I quickly like to acknowledge the EPSRC for funding and again, thank Lawrence, Keith, Paul, Rob and Nikos for their contributions to this work. And I'd also like to acknowledge Chuck Farrar from Los Alamos and Mark Bateman from EDF Energy um, as they provide us input um, for the risk-based decision-making make decision -making framework. Um, if you are interested in any of the, reading a bit more about any of the work, um, you can find a couple of uh, journal papers that are out there. And um, thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Aidan. Let me stop the recording.